Hi, I'm David Domke. I'm chair of the Department of Communication at the University of Washington. Every once in a while I get a chance to sit down with alums who have done or are doing just remarkable things in the communities that they live in. This, at this moment I have a chance to sit down with Camille Elmore Trummer, who is our 2018 Outstanding Early Career alum. We use this kind of moment of recognition to, to just take note of and to honor and to celebrate people who are already doing incredible things. So that's my chat with the chair at this moment. Thanks, Camille, for sitting down with me. Thanks for having me. Sure. So you, if I recall correctly, grew up in Portland, is that right? I did, yeah. Born and raised. Born and raised in Portland. So uh, that, you know, that's Oregon, right? So <laughs> you come in, yeah. coming to the UW, how did that journey happen? Yeah. Well, you know, when I was applying to colleges, um, my parents really encouraged me to think a little bit outside the box and consider going elsewhere, because they both did. Mm. And um, you know, I considered going to the other school in Oregon. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe I won't name it here, <laughs> but um, I did want to venture out and meet new people and feel what it was like to be elsewhere on my own. And so I applied to the University of Washington. I was accepted and I was excited to start a life in Seattle. When you came here, did you know people here? Did you have a, like a family contact or anything? I didn't know one single person. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so it was exciting. It, I was anxious. But um, I, there were going to be 50,000 kids on the campus, so I figured I'll meet at least a few folks that I vibe with, so. Sure. Um, so when you came here, you got involved in communication, the Department of Communication. What drew you into the major, or what, what were the things that you said, I want, to, I want to emphasize this area? Well, I had come from um, a family uh, where I grew up with two black police officers. So debates mm. and talking about current events was something that was happening in our household every night at the dinner table. Mm. And I really liked the art of communication, both um, you know, implicit and explicit and understanding body language and how all mm. of the things that we do every day when we talk with folks um, can be translated into different types of meanings and values attached. And so when I walked into your classroom my freshman mm, yeah. year in <laughs> Communications 201, um, I was introduced into a whole another world of communication, mm. political communication, cultural communication, mm. and I fell deeply in love with the art and the craft of communicating and thinking about how we um, share information. And after your class, I took a few more of your classes <laughs> and some classes with some other professors here, um, Professor Thurlow, Professor Joseph, mm. and I ended up declaring the major my sophomore year and was ready to rock and roll and keep on learning, so. Did you come to UW in 2005? I did, yeah. Yeah, 2009 graduate? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, one question I wanna ask you is, people who watch this, uh, they tend to be students and alums, faculty and staff. So thinking about a potential student who might be watching this, mm -hmm. is there something that, um, anything that you might recall or think of that occurs af shortly after you graduate and it's either something you make happen or something that you just kind of step into that becomes influential upon you for who you who you further become professionally and personally? Yeah. I think one thing that I learned, and maybe it was influenced by the perspectives and opinions of others, is that communication is a field in which you can apply to many different sectors. Mm. And I thought, if I studied communication, perhaps I can only be a journalist, or um, I can only be a communications specialist in an administrative role, or um, in the nonprofit world. But what I've learned is that you can apply communication to many different fields. Um, having an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington in communication and a graduate degree in strategic communication from Northwestern allowed me to uh, venture into public policy, mm. to start thinking about how to apply communication strategies to urban planning um, and sustainability efforts, and thinking through how you might apply communication theory to education and understanding how you can maximize um, you know, messages and, s and untold stories to tell uh, a larger kind of narrative about what's happening in the world around a lot of variety of things. So I took that as this field allows me to apply my skills in a variety of different ways and um, it has greatly influenced the way that I have been able to um, just navigate in my career mm -hmm. and, and um, what I practice today. So that's a broader conception than you think you might have had necessarily when you were in school here? Absolutely, absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. 
when was there ever a moment when you were in college where you you had to justify or explain your major to your parents? <laughs> Absolutely. Not only to my parents, but to my friends. A lot of folks were like, well, what do you even do in the field <laughs> of communication? And it's like, well, usually we help you clarify <laughs> what you mean when yeah, you say yeah, the things yeah. you say. Um, and so people are, are constantly trying to understand what I do. And now that I work for a communications firm, it's um, telling stories, it's crafting messages, it's design, it's creating collateral, it's building campaigns. So it's, it's everything um, that you see in the real world when you are receiving information. There's a communication strategy or perspective to that. And a lot of folks don't know that. So I try to uh, unearth that for folks as, as, uh, as often as I can. Yeah, I think communication um, is kind of like food in that it's, uh, it's this thing that everybody partakes in. Yeah. Everybody knows it's an essential element, and yet most people don't give it a tremendous amount of thought, right? Yep. Until yep. suddenly it's not going the way that they <laughs> thought it was going to go, yes. right? Yes. And then they're like, what happened? How come, how come I'm not feeling good? Well, it could be all that candy you ate, right? Or, <laughs> yeah. or how come I'm not achieving my goals? Well, how are you communicating those things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then it's crisis comes, and that's a whole <laughs> other industry. Right. <laughs> And it, it is kind of a superpower in today's world to have those skill sets that you have because uh, it's clearly a contested cultural political space. So being able to, to bring together groups, listen, articulate, translate, all that is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I enjoy it. You've done a lot of different things. Just from my own knowledge of your background, you've been in Chicago mm -hmm. working on some policies with the Chicago Public Schools. Yep. Um, you ha were in Portland, back in Portland now, worked for the city government. Yep. Right now you're in your own, uh, in an own communication firm called Brink yep. Communication. Yeah. So out of these different pieces, is there a, an item or an activity or an achievement or a single thing you might share with us that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, absolutely. When I worked for former um, Portland Mayor Charlie Hales, we were embarking on a journey of creating the 2035 Comprehensive Plan, mm. which was basically the urban planning plan for the next 25 years. So basically figuring out how Portland was going to grow up and not out, right? Un understanding density and the implications of density um, and housing and all of the intersections that are really um, impacting a lot of folks in Portland as it becomes more expensive and more difficult to find basic amenities at affordable price point. And so um, I learned what it meant to create, address, uh, mm. and kind of really break down policies that are going to have a huge impact for the next 20 years, put them into law, and watch them kind of um, manifest as new buildings go up, as new um, architecture firms land in Portland and mm. try to figure out how are we going to house all of these new people that keep showing up in Portland every day, which is like 111 people, which Seattle is experiencing the same thing. So that was a monumental mm. moment for me to sit down at a desk with the mayor, look at these huge maps and figure out mm. how are we going to do this, right? And rally the entire city of Portland, advocates, folks that are debating what density should look like, mm. and bringing them along, uh, you know, to... Um, not necessarily a consensus, but, but a place where we can say, this feels good. This feels like it might work. And if it doesn't work, we should come back to the table to figure out what type of revisions we can make in the future. But for now, we have a plan and we can all rally around it for the most part. So that was huge for me because I don't come from an urban planning background, yeah. obviously. I come from a communication background. But it's also about crafting a message that allows folks to understand what it is we're doing and why it matters. So. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds overwhelming, <laughs> yeah. but also exciting yeah. and, um, and certainly something to be proud about. Yeah. 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 Um, now, you left that kind of, eventually, you moved from that kind of a job with yeah. City Hall, working in the administration for the mayor, right, yeah. yep. to, to work in the private sector, right? Yeah. Wh so wh how come? What was, the, what was the drive there? Yeah, it was a hard decision. I had worked in nonprofit um, in my entire career. And then um, I got approached from one of the uh, partners at Brink Communication about considering to jump into what I call the dark side, the <laughs> private world. And I was apprehensive because mm. I didn't know what to expect. And I wanted to make sure that whatever work that I did, it was going to be positively impacting the communities that I serve. And so Brink is at, nestled in this really great space of 
Um, working at the intersections of urban innovation, public health, and racial and social justice, but mm. applying a communications lens, a strategic lens to all of their work, and helping companies and organizations make good on their commitments to improve our communities. And so I thought, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like a great space. So I've been there for over a year, and it's been a really wild and fun ride. Mm. Yeah. So let's, uh, to kind of, as we begin to wind down this, in this, in this conversation, think back to when you were here, 2005 to 2009, mm -hmm. and if you were 2018 Camille, and you had a chance to talk to 2006, let's say, mm -hmm. Camille, um, <laughs> with all of the knowledge and experiences you have now, what would you tell that version of you? Mm. I would tell that version of myself that deep listening, intentional listening, is just as important as communicating. Mm. It is an essential ingredient to becoming a better communicator. I do a lot of in community engagement work um, in low-income communities, underserved, up underrepresented uh, communities, and one thing that I find that a lot of us as practitioners do is we come into spaces and we talk, mm. we tell, mm -hmm. we instruct, we rarely listen. And I think I would have benefited from having that skill uh, refined a bit when I was uh, a young mm. sophomore at the university and there was so much information coming at me and I wanted to you know respond to all of it every time and I think I, I, it would have been better if I had just done some deep listening to understand where people are coming from different perspectives they all mm. matter you know I uh, I've had the privilege over the last couple of years to spend some time with uh, a great civil rights hero dr. Bernard Lafayette mm -hmm. and he has a phrase where he says you have to listen hard enough so that you're changed. Yep, right? absolutely. And we don't listen to be changed mostly in our culture. We listen in order to then tell, to speak back, right? Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah, and I think listening allows us to um, help others become better storytellers mm -hmm. or serve as better s storytellers on behalf of others um, to change hearts and minds. And we can't do that if we don't hear where others are coming from. Mm. So last question, looking out into the future, 10 years from now, um, so 2028, um, <laughs> I might, I'll just say, you heard, if you're not holding office <laughs> somewhere, okay, if you're not uh, serving in some political e leadership position, or even if you are, what, what would you s hope that people would be saying about you professionally? Like mm -hmm. this is, if you know Camille, you know this, like this is something she is. Um, I would s hope that folks would say that I was inclusive, mm. that I was um, open to being held accountable, um, and that I was willing to do whatever it takes to make our communities safer, mm. more inclusive, um, more tolerant, um, more space or creating more space where f we can celebrate each other, celebrate our differences. Yeah. Um, I would hope that folks would say that about me because that's what I strive to do and I'm constantly learning. It's a journey, but that's what I hope folks would say. Mm, that's great. Well, we are really honored to, uh, to have you as our 2018 Early Career Outstanding alum. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I'm David Donkey. I'm chair of the Department of Communication at the University of Washington. Just had a great opportunity here to talk with Camille Elmore Trummer, um, our 2018 Outstanding Early Career Alumna. Thank you for joining us.